Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Welcome to the monthly Connexus webinar series. And uh, today we're going to be talking about defense and depth, creating effective layers of cybersecurity to protect your stores. Next slide. Our hosts today are Allie Russell and Jenny Bullard from Connexus. So thank you very much, ladies, for organizing the, the webinar and for all that you do behind the scenes. My name is Cara Gunderson. I'm the chair of the Connexus Data Security Committee. And today our webinar is being presented by Acumera. Acumera has been providing managed security services to convenience stores for the past 15 years. And uh, these guys really know their stuff. And so today we're very, very excited to have uh, the CTO with us, Brett Stewart. We also have Dwayne Mangan, who is the director of infrastructure for them. And we also have Mark Palmer, who is the Director of Technical Solutions. And as you can see, uh, these gentlemen have a lot of initials after their names, such as uh, PCI Professional, Internal Security Assessor, um, Qualified Integrator and Reseller. So uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for today. So moving on to the agenda, I'll go through a few housekeeping items. We'll talk about Connexus a little bit, and obviously everybody's here for the presentation today. And then we'll go through uh, questions and answers. Moving on to the housekeeping items, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available in approximately 30 days. You can find it on YouTube if you go to Connexus Online, or you can go to Connexus.org, the Connexus website, and go under Resources and Webinars, and that's where you can find the listing of all of the monthly Connexus webinars. The slide deck will be made available to everyone. Upon the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to a very short survey. It's only like three or four questions. And uh, really what we would encourage you to do is to complete the survey because included in there is gives you an opportunity to provide us with future webinar ideas and, um, and things that you'd like to see us present. And once you complete the survey, then following that, in a few hours, you'll receive a link to the uh, presentation itself where you can, you can actually download the presentation. We do ask participants to ask questions using the GoToWebinar question panel. So if you have that up, it's, there's a little question section and you can click on that. And so we ask you to please uh, type in your questions. All attendees are on, in um, listen-only mode. And we do ask that you refrain from asking vendor-specific questions. And if you do have any other questions or concerns, please email connexus at info at connexus.org. Moving on, I'd like to talk just a little briefly about Connexus because Connexus is really an independent nonprofit, and when I say member-driven, I mean really member-driven and technology organization. So, for example, Acumera is a member of Connexus. Myself, my company is a member of Connexus, and we are all volunteers. And so, Connexus sets the standards on data exchange, security, mobile, commerce. They also really provide a vision um, for emerging technology and trends and really are an advocate for, an for our industry overall. Moving on to the webinar schedule. And uh, we've had some really great webinars in the past. And if you've missed them, please go to YouTube, go to Connexus Online, and you can find them there. Or you can go to Connexus, as I mentioned earlier, connexus.org under resources and, and webinars. And you can, you can replay some of the old webinars. And we've got some great webinars also coming up uh, in April. The folks from Security Innovation are going to talk about uh, getting fished and how not to get fished and how to train your employees. In May, Mako Networks is going to talk about firewall compliance and the basics and the benefits of security. In June, uh, David Dizel from Connexus and Ian Jacobs from W3C are going to give us an update on W3C itself. So in July, uh, we will have a webinar on skimming. In August, um, we're going to we're going to um, plug that in very very soon here. I think we just secured that webinar. In September, the folks at Omega are going to be giving us an updated uh, presentation on their data science that they presented last year in 2018. November, we'll have a an um, Brian Russell and Linda Toast from Verifone and Connexus, respectively, will provide us an update on outdoor EMB. 
And then again, we do appreciate the feedback and the surveys so that you can give us ideas as far as what you'd like to see in December. Moving on, Connexus has our annual conference at the end of May, excuse me, end of April, beginning of May in Nashville. And so we'd like to thank the 2018 Diamond sponsors. And it's truly a great event to get together with folks um, and, and all the volunteers from Connexus who actually set these standards. And it's really the brain trust of the petroleum technology. So um, with that, I think we'll move into the, uh, the presentation itself. And so gentlemen, thanks again for sharing your, your, your knowledge and your experience and your time with everybody today. So I'll hand it over to the Acumira folks. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. This is Brett Stewart. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Acumira, and I'm going to uh, introduce the material today with a definition, and then we're going to discuss, uh, uh, my, my colleagues are gonna discuss three different threat scenarios that we often uh, see occurring in retail stores. Uh, I'd like to start out by uh, uh, posing the following question. Is your store network like a box of bonbons? Uh, in the cybersecurity game uh, long, a, a while ago when I started, People talked about, you know, you have a firewall, it's like a, a moat around your castle, you put in rules, that's like the drawbridge that goes up and down. So our, our store is a, is a castle, and you know, we're in control of the drawbridge over the moat. But uh, as the threat actors became more sophisticated, we, the community, started to realize that's really more than the, the castle and moat model, it's the bonbon model, because you just have this one relatively thin shell, and if you pierce that thin shell, you get to the good stuff right away. So what we say today is, you know, don't be uh, a box of bonbons. You want to be more like an onion. You want to have many layers of defense so that if threat actors figure out how to pierce one, or, and it, and it happens, if you have a process failure with respect to one of your defenses, you've got a layers ahead and behind um, to keep an attacker from reaching your critical assets. In this onion graphic here, you will note little numbers behind each layer. Those numbers are references to the sections of the uh, PCI data security standard that uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that everyone here is familiar with. Uh, and we'll be making specific reference to the data security standard uh, as a collection, a, a really great collection of best practices as we go through the seminar today. So what is defense in depth? The, on your screen, you will see a, a paraphrase of the Wikipedia definition, and it's pretty simply using lots of layers. Uh, it's kind of like having a latch and a deadbolt, uh, and maybe a barricade out front, uh, you know, and maybe a, uh, uh, a trap behind the first door to, with a second door. You know, it's whatever layers that you can uh, put uh, to keep threat actors from getting to your critical data assets. Uh, many people uh, use a variety of security products, a variety of vendors to, uh, to build these layers, and, and that's great. That's the standard practice. One of the most important layers is always the people and process in your organization. Um, now, some people have said, hey, you know, defense in depth isn't the right way to think about this. You know, layered security isn't the right way to think about this. You need this one particular bit of uh, technology, security technology, and then you'll be fine. I want to challenge that notion. Uh, you really need the multiple layers. Uh, there's not a single control in the PCI data security standard that I think is useless. Well, there is one. Um, but uh, there's 300 of them and the other 299 are fine. One of the things I do want to emphasize though is you can't defend it if you can't see it and there's no point in seeing it if you're not going to uh, do something about what you see uh, when uh, security events happen. So continuous visibility and continuous monitoring are always an important part of a layered uh, security solution. Today, we're gonna to talk about three attack vectors. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about IoT devices. This is basically 
everything that isn't a browser that's in your store. Then we're going to talk about the browsers, and then we're going to talk about uh, remote access. And uh, to start us off talking about IoT devices, we have Mark Palmer, our Acumera's Director of Technical Solutions. There's a great IoT Connexus presentation Jeff Gibson of ControlScan gave about a year and a half ago. Jeff did a great job on familiarizing us with IoT. We included a link to Jeff's PowerPoint in case you cared to refresh your memory about it. The Internet of Things refers to the concept of extending internet connectivity beyond conventional computing platforms like an office computer or mobile device. It's connecting any range of dumb or non-internet enabled physical devices to the internet. Things like tank gauges, video, video cameras, ATMs, menu boards, safes, any of those devices that don't necessarily have a browser right behind them. Analysts predict the number of connected IoT devices is increasing. In fact, by this time next year, they predict 25 billion IoT devices will be connected to the internet. Your stores are likely going to start having more and more IoT devices in them than traditional PC platforms. As we connect our stores, kitchens, and restaurants with more and more IoT devices, our reliance on good cybersecurity practices continues. With so many devices and tools on a network, visibility is paramount. In a recent survey, it was noted that most IT staff are confident their IoT network is secured, but far fewer were confident they could fully identify all of the devices connected onto their network. A defense in depth approach needs to encompass both visibility and continuous monitoring. You can't secure what you can't see. IoT devices pose problems for organizations in multiple ways. They increase the number of access points both into and out of an organization, increasing the size of the organization's threat surface. An attacker might be unable to enter the network via a secured personal computer or an office computer, but they might be able to obtain network privileges by subverting unattended printers or a smart thermostat or some other poorly secured IoT device. Breaches of IoT devices can lead to an organization facing losses of customer trust, customer data, and that could lead to brand reputation problems as well as significant fines. Recently, researchers have discovered thousands of automatic tank gauges connected to the internet with access left open from anywhere. And all of these devices had no password protection at all. Despite industry efforts, the number of exposed ATGs continues to rise. Leaving devices exposed like this can provide a foothold into your network. So what can we do about this? Looking at the basic concepts of defense and depth can help. Start with awareness. Make sure your employees are aware and trained on who can, who is authorized rather to access the equipment and service it. You want to make sure that there's a physical barrier behind the equipment as well. Place it in a locked back room or in a cabinet. Work with your IT vendor or your IT staff on making sure that the connections to the device are restricted. Does your ATG really need to be accessed from anywhere on the internet? Make sure you use good intrusion detection systems and ensure that it's both visible and being monitored. And the last two items, make sure that you've segmented your ATG away from other devices in the network and disable any default manufacturer passwords or change them. Let's look at another example. Webcams, video cameras, and security systems can be exploited in a variety of ways from simple to complex. In this screenshot, you can see from a high definition security camera, you can collect credit card information with instructions easily found on YouTube. 
So how can you protect yourself here? Using those same concepts of defense and depth, start again with awareness. Make sure you train your employees on who's authorized to physically access equipment. Limit physical access to the equipment as well. Again, lock it in a manager's office or in a cabinet. And ensure your IT department or vendor has re reviewed the communication requirements of your DVRs. Again, does everybody in the internet need to access your security system? Probably not. Make sure you use an intrusion detection system and ensure your devices are visible and continuously monitored. And again, the last two, make sure the DVR is on its own network segment and change any default passwords. Let's look at one more situation. ATMs. ATM jackpotting can happen when a criminal installs software or hardware at ATMs that can force the machine to dispense huge amounts of cash. Physical access to the machine was all that was needed to jackpot ATMs. In jackpotting cases, threat actors posing as ATM employees were given physical access to the ATM by an uninformed store employee. With jackpotting, you don't necessarily need to buy any technology to do the basics. We just need to make sure employees are trained and the processes are in place to limit unauthorized access to the ATM. Remember, defense in depth is not just about adding more technology. Be sure to look at your organization's training and processes too. If you don't know where to begin, Take a look at a security framework like the PCI DSS and prioritize visibility and monitoring of your networks. There are a lot of controls to implement, but it's not an impossible situation. Every control you implement increases the security position of your connected systems. Here's a list of some questions you want to work with your IT department or your IT vendor. Make sure that they have a way to visualize all the devices connected to your networks. Ask them how quickly they are able to detect or isolate new or rogue devices. Check and see if there's any new technologies or other protective remote access layers they can place in front of devices like ATGs and DVRs or other devices that don't have good security controls. Make sure they have an intrusion detection system that detects anomalous network traffic and then do something about it when it's observed. And again, make sure that IoT devices are on a different segment other from the card holder data. And finally, do you have a managed detection response process? And have you tested it recently for effectiveness and improved on it? Our next presenter, Dwayne Mangan, will take us through browser security. Thanks, Mark. Uh, before we dive into browser security here, this is another good moment to mention another Connexus resource. Uh, George from Omega ATC did a presentation on WannaCry and other ransomware. Uh, employee browsing is one of the ways that ransomware and things like WannaCry spread these days. So if you're more interested in this topic, we encourage you to go check out that webinar. Diving into our comments here on employee browsing, uh, we've noticed it, it's very easy for folks when you immediately start uh, thinking about employee browsing. It's easy just to slip right into thinking about uh, controlling time management concerns when it comes to employees. Uh, obviously, we don't want them spending time on those social networks and those streaming services because we want them working while they're at work. Uh, but there's more than just time management concerns here. Accessing those social media networks, those streaming sites, and other sites have real security risks these days. And we'd encourage you to think more from the perspective of if it's not the employee using this access, or if it is a malicious employee, kind of that insider threat, if they're using this access, what could they do with it? And it's also easy to think that, well, employees don't have many places they can get onto the internet with a browser from the store. And as we bring in more IoT devices and more services for employees at the store, that's just not true anymore. We're all familiar with the manager's workstation. That's there so they can get on the internet. But things like training PCs, most of the training is online these days. Even your time clock consoles, most of those are just running on type of Windows. And so a crafty employee can find a way to turn off the time clock and turn on a browser. 
and you also have tablets that are running around the store for a variety of purposes. Uh, normally, we try to lock these devices down. There's usually some way to get around those, and employees will find those eventually. So they do have multiple points of access from the store. And malware is shifting these days. It used to take some sort of action from the employee to actually cause an infection. Now, just clicking on a link is all it takes to infect a machine. And once those uh, infections are on the machine, uh, those advanced persistent threats as they are these days, they're designed to hide their activity. They don't want you to know they're there. You can only detect that they're there from a network level. So you need to consider that and do something about it. Now, a few more stats here. Maybe you look at all of those things and maybe you're like, oh, our employees are pretty good. We're a small shop. I don't think we really have to worry about any of that. We've done awareness training. They're on the up and up. Our friends over at ZDNet have found that one in 61 emails in your inbox now contain a malicious link. And I think we all will agree we get at least 61 emails a day. I know I get quite a few more. Uh, Verizon, through their DBIR, also found that 4% of people will click on any given phishing campaign. What that means, you run the math on that real quick, for your average 50-person 50 si 50 uh, size company, you've got two people every day that are going to get a malicious link in their email and probably click on it, so the threat is real. And this isn't something that only happens occasionally. These are all news stories here that we've pulled from very recently uh, with a, a fake Dun & Bradstreet company complaint email, which is something you might be looking for. You know, are we having any complaints registered against us? There's a fake one out there that exactly mirrors the uh, real one, and it's delivering TrickBot. Uh, Google recently published a reminder that other governments are actively working against us, and right before the last summit that our government had with North Korea, North Korean hackers were out there sending out phishing mails to those who would be interested in news from that summit. And even for those who have, uh, of us who have been pushing security with our employees, we want them to jump on those password reminders and everything. Well, the top phishing subject line of last year related to reminding employees to change their passwords. So even that is working against us these days. If you need even more recent examples of how real the threat is here, just this month, last week, Google Chrome uh, released a zero-day exploit notice that was actively being used in the wild, uh, where because it was a, a compromise in the browser, if someone using Google Chrome, regardless of the operating system, if they clicked on a link to a specially crafted web page, uh, the remote attacker would then have full access to the machine through the browser. Uh, and this just happened very recently. Side note, if you have Google Chrome, make sure you go update it right now. And even if you've locked down all these other avenues of attack for malicious actors out there uh, and you think you have things tightened down, even the messaging systems of other services are being exploited to deliver these malicious URLs. LinkedIn is something that you may want your employees to be on as a, as a part of their job uh, to represent the company, to respond to messages, to share things. Even the messaging system inside of LinkedIn is being used to deliver malicious URLs. So it's not just the browser and General, it's not just email, it's also all of these services that people use. So what can we do about this? What are some additional layers of protection we can add to our security onion here to, to, to help uh, mitigate against all of these risks? Number one, we've talked about it before, I'm sure you're doing it, awareness training. It's a PCI requirement, it's a great thing. It should be more than a once a year thing though. It's required to do it once a year, the more you can do this monthly or quarterly or on a, on a increased cadence than just yearly, the more top of mind it's gonna be for employees, the more likely they're going to be to uh, ask questions when they see something they're not sure about. We also recommend that you deploy a web filter. Uh, web filter is a great way to put something in between the employee's browser and the internet to help protect against many of these ta attacks. You can use whitelisting on that if you have a well-curated list of sites you know they need to go to. Many of them also have category filtering you can enable on there. And we also recommend that you apply this to the entire network, not just one or two machines. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper into WebFilter here in a moment. 
You can also use your IDS to help uh, mitigate against all of these risks. Make sure that it's plugged into some sort of threat intel feeds. They're getting live data so that as these things come out, such as the Google Chrome exploit, it's going to be getting those updates in real time to augment your firewall rules. Make sure you have that predetermined managed detection and response plan that Mark talked about so that when an alert shows up, you don't have to think about what you're going to do about that. And also remember that segmentation really does help against this. If you're considering what someone else could do with the employee's web access, if they were able to control it, um, it can put a different perspective on where machines can go and what they can talk to. Isolation goes a long way for those things that don't need to talk to the CTE and don't even talk to other things on site. Your training PC is a great example of this. It needs internet access. It shouldn't be able to see anything else at the site. Make sure you isolate it appropriately. We'd also encourage you to consider your headquarters remote access needs. Uh, for smaller shops, it's easy to get lulled into a sense of security that headquarters is that castle and everything in there um, is okay. But most of the time, headquarters doesn't need complete access to the site. Carefully consider which workstations at headquarters actually need remote access to the site, tighten those firewall rules, those VPN rules down to only that which is necessary, and then you'll limit anything that could happen if something actually does get compromised. So diving a little bit here into what a web filter does and how it actually works, we've got a little diagram here of how basic web browsing works without a web filter. And on the left, you can see someone at a console using a web browser to go to the internet. We all type in a URL that we've remembered, google.com, something like that. The computer goes out to some sort of DNS server to look that up. Maybe it's an internal DNS, maybe it's an external DNS. It changes that URL into a number that the computer understands. The computer then goes to that number out on the internet, retrieves the web page, and comes back. What you notice missing from this diagram is anything in the middle to see if that is actually a safe website to go to. So when you deploy a web filter, you're going to put something into the middle of this conversation here to help kind of uh, mitigate against anything the employee doesn't know about or mitigate against them clicking on one of those malicious URLs. So you're going to insert that web filter in between the employee's browser and the internet. Two common ways of doing this are either to use proxy settings on those machines or to simply deploy it using DNS. Either way, you've inserted yourself somewhere in that conversation so that this other machine that's getting continuously updated threat intel can look at where the employee is trying to go, check that against everything that you have allowed and blocked on the server, and then make a decision for the employee should they be going to this. Not only does that help with some of those time management concerns, but it also helps with some of these zero day type exploits if you have sites that are uh, uncategorized, also blocked on the server there, it's gonna tell that employee, hey, maybe you shouldn't be going here. Two other things you'll want to dive into on the web filter, uh, most of them have what you see on the right here, which is a way to do a whitelist where you explicitly grant access. You have a well curated list of sites that you know employees need to go to in order to do their job. Uh, and if you are in the place where you can use that and start right there, that is a great place to be because then you know everything else is blocked from their access. If you need to work your way up to that, category filtering is a great way to do that. It allows you to go through, decide which uh, categories of sites sound safe, sound necessary for your employees to go to. You can turn those on, and we recommend that you turn everything off and then use the reporting capabilities of that web filter to monitor what's being accessed and what is being blocked and determine if any additional tweaking needs to be done from there. Usually you can block things in a category, but then if you do kick up one or two sites that are in that category getting blocked that need to be whitelisted, you can override that category filtering with a whitelist. So going back to our security onion here, uh, we remind you that next month there is that phishing webinar that Cara mentioned earlier. Uh, that would be a great follow-up to this. Be sure to join in on, on that. And be sure to take a look at the other layers of the onion here to see how they could help with employee browsing. 
the physical access layer is a real one that can help make sure that those training PCs aren't just out all the time where anyone can use them in an unsupervised fashion if they don't need to be doing training activities. Uh, make sure that the manager's uh, office is locked if the manager's workstation is the only thing on site that could get online and the manager is the only one that's supposed to be doing it. Make sure it's locked or turned off or that man only the manager has the password to it so nobody else can use that machine. Take a look at your perimeter security, deploy those web filters and IDS as we've talked about, and don't forget that segmentation does provide real value here. So to wrap up the browsing device attack vector here, again, the PCI DSS offers a great list of controls. If you're wondering where to start, start there. Watch the upcoming phishing awareness webinar next month and sit down with your IT department. We've provided a list of questions here. Uh, sit down with your IT department or your network vendor, whoever takes care of this for you. Ask them these questions. Can they run all of your browsing through a web filter? Can they apply that to the entire site? Because it does provide real security to those IoT devices that you may not be able to control where they go online if they get compromised. A web filter can help with that. Um, how can they detect an isolate attack? How quickly can they do that? Do they have an MDR? Is that predetermined? Have they thought through that? Um, how can you segment all of these devices? Very few of them actually need to talk to the cardholder data environment. And do you have an IDS that can help with alerting on all of this? So now I'm gonna pass it back over to Brett to talk about remote access. Um. Once again, I'd like to refer everyone to existing Connexus resources. The topic of remote access compliance and, and who's responsible for what when remote access occurs has been previously discussed uh, by Connexus. Uh, so, you know, use the wealth of resources available through Connexus to stay on top of this uh, question, just as we have uh, pointed out for the other uh, uh, subject areas. So, First off, I wanna address why people get concerned about remote access. And the answer is pretty simple. It's because there are so many breaches that happen through a remote access vector. Um, I'm displaying some data from a TrustWave investigative report that suggests that remote access security weaknesses are accounting for close to half of the uh, breaches of point of sale devices that are occurring. Uh, now, I think we are all uh, aware of a couple of high-profile breaches that had a remote access vector. One of the most famous ones is Target, where a third-party uh, IoT device support company uh, managed to get a keystroke logger logged on an employee uh, a laptop. That employee then used uh, permanently existing remote access links to uh, access target and the bad guys followed the employee in and remained uh, uh, re re retained their access for a long period of time while they developed a kill chain or developed a strategy to um, install malware and scrape credit card numbers out of the memory of the point of sale. Similarly, uh, home, the Home Depot breach from a while ago uh, had a similar sort of situation where third-party vendor, vendor credentials were used, then a persistent remote access uh, connection was used, and malware got installed. In both of these cases, uh, there was significant uh, customer uh, cardholder data loss. Uh, both of them resulted in fines and a lot of uh, bad press to the brands of these uh, two uh, big organizations. But we don't have to look back in time. We just have to look last week. Um, Huddle House uh, data breach got uh, announced here around the early part of February. It appears that for a period of two years, there was an ongoing uh, risk to customer data and the uh, announcement suggests, I have not seen a forensic investigation or talked to anybody about this. I'm just going off the public announcements. Um, we are told again that a third party POS vendor support desk uh, was compromised, and then those tools and the ability to deploy malware uh, led to the compromise of many Huddle House locations. Now, Huddle House is not in the C-Store industry. Uh, they're uh, one marketplace over, um, but these sorts of remote access data breaches uh, still are a big issue. 
So how do you defend? Well, uh, Pat Morita from the Karate Kid once said, best defense, no be there. And if there is no way for a vendor to access your store all the time or without your knowledge, then that's very unlikely to be the source of a data breach. Vendor remote access is unlikely to be a source of a data breach. There are many PCI controls that uh, are relevant to this topic. Uh, there are controls that relate to vendor password management. Vendor access passwords have to not work until the moment that the vendor actually needs to do access. Um, the fact that a vendor can do access to critical systems at all makes you raise a bunch of other questions. One of those questions should be, is your vendor support center itself PCI compliant if you're going to connect them to uh, your sensitive uh, network equipment? And a very important question is, can the vendor access my system anytime they want to? I think this is an operational issue as well as a security issue. I've had uh, people that I've talked to say they were annoyed that a vendor did a firmware update without their knowledge or pre pre-arrangement or pre-planning. In this case, it was uh, not a security issue. There wasn't someone trying to steal information, but the uh, you, you might not be ready for your vendor to do something like a firmware update without your knowledge. So, you know, it's a good question. Is there always on access to the store? So once again, we can look at the security onion and we can uh, talk about uh, security in different layers. Uh, first off, uh, make sure everyone is trained about under what circumstance, under what circumstances your employees can grant remote access to vendors. Uh, make sure that you have a good perimeter security system uh, that will enable ephemeral connections, meaning not always on connections when you need them as the PCI DSS requires and have them uh, torn down when you're done and have them tear themselves down uh, if somebody forgets to do a manual process. Uh, again, use your IDS to watch all that network traffic and make sure that it is legitimate and not uh, a, a malicious actor uh, masquerading as uh, someone from the vendor. Again, segmentation where you uh, can segment is always going to be helpful. And uh, again, the PCI password complexity and rotation rules are a very important layer of defense. So as we always say, the uh, the PCI DSS is a great place to start. They have a lot of best practice rules. Use a prioritized approach. Pick the ones that seem the best bang for the buck and, and actually uh, implement those rules. They will substantially increase your security posture. Uh, some questions to ask your IT department or your network vendor is, uh, first off, if people are getting remote access to critical data, are they PCI compliant? Because they are coming into your PCI scope. Um, ask if your vendors can access your stores from anywhere at will, or if they have to be physically present in a PCI compliant uh, remote support center. I'm aware of one uh, remote support center for a common POS where the support employees have to place their uh, cell phones and any other equipment uh, into lockers before they can enter the uh, support center and the support center is compliant and very locked down. And once they're in there, they uh, don't necessarily have uh, uh, permanent access. Uh, they, there are still some legacy systems that only enable permanent access, but this particular center relies heavily on ephemeral access and compliance uh, with the, uh, the PCI uh, requirements. Uh, one question to ask is, who's accessing your systems remotely? Um, ask your IT department or your network vendor if those accesses are being logged, and actually take a look at the logs to make sure that logging mechanism is working. And finally, the PCI DSS requires that remote access support self-terminate. Uh, make sure it really does. So we have... Um, uh, covered these three areas in about the time that we had allocated for it. Uh, kind of a wrap up is to just remind everybody, be an onion, don't be a box of bonbons, have lots of layers of security. Some of them are very simple and low cost and easy to do, and they will 
provide layers of protection that will uh, save your uh, will save your critical assets from exploitation. If one fails, the other layers will step in and help keep you safe. Segmentation is a great thing. Be sure to look carefully at what devices that can talk to what, need to talk to what, and make sure that devices that don't need to commu communicate with each other are segmented away from your critical data. Make sure you've got visibility of everything attached to your network. And again, back to the PCI DSS um, for guidance on adding layers of security. And at this point, uh, we'd like to throw uh, the webinar open for questions. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That was a lot of information and very comprehensive information. And just wanted to remind everybody to please use the question panel and type your questions in the GoToWebinar panel. And um, while everybody's busy typing their questions in, I do have a couple questions. And um, now, obviously, PCI DSS is a requirement for every merchant that accepts payment cards. And so, but, but there are, some say that that's good enough, um, but some say that you should, that's just a benchmark. Um, I mean, you guys are in the, in the data security business. I mean, is there more that people can do be up, be up above and beyond the PCI? That's should a they? great, that's a great question, Kara. I would like to say that our orientation here is we really focus on security. In other words, we're going to take every approach that we can economically implement to make the networks we're responsible for secure. So we're, we're, our focus is on security primarily. And then after we're sure things are secure, we look at the compliance aspect. So to be compliant and not be secure seems to us to be perhaps less desirable than to be secure and not be compliant. So I wouldn't, as you suggest, I would not stop with things that are in the PCI DSS. I think the PCI DSS is a great list of security controls, but you yeah. should assess the risk to your network and do every reasonable thing that you can do to keep it secure. Because as we tried to say by example and, and by specific analysis, the threat environment is active and the threat is uh, real. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate that, and um, I think I think most would 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 agree with you there because I don't think these days you can be too secure. Um, Mark, you had mentioned earlier in the webinar about all of the IoT devices in the C store environment, and it has been a few years since I was in operations and in, in community store operations, and I'm amazed at the number of IoT devices that are out there and things that you don't even think about. You know, I, I think you had mentioned something like exactly that, that like menu boards are huge, um, um, you know, fountain machines, coffee machines, anything with monitoring. I mean, how, how do you really get your arms around that and, and how do you know which devices are really, um, have, have that connectivity in your store? So the, the primary thing to do is, is just like what we were saying in the presentation, you want to continuously monitor the network uh, and be aware of the devices that are connected. And uh, you want to get uh, on board with your IT staff and your vendor uh, and make sure they account for all the devices that they're bringing to uh, bringing into the the stores. Uh, I know we've had uh, engagements where. Uh, customers have decided to uh, offload the IoT connected devices onto a, a, a completely separate physical network from the store's payment system. I and mean, that, I mean, really following <laughs> true uh, physical separation in that the two networks were uh, completely separate. So, I mean, there's a lot of yeah. ways to do it. There's a lot more devices that we're going to be seeing coming online. And again, planning and uh, for monitoring the devices and uh, getting that visibility, those should be the priorities. And right. uh, this is Brett. I'd like to add uh, another uh, comment to what Mark just said. Uh, if your IT department or your network vendor is continuously monitoring your network and can detect and identify every attached device, 
that can actually be very helpful in complying with one of the PCI DSS requirements relating to inventories of devices that are in scope for PCI. One of the things that we say uh, uh, a lot of times, Cara, is if you have a great security control, don't fail to apply it to devices that you might not think of as in scope. Um, so, yep. yeah, so for example, if you can get a list of every device attached at all your stores uh, and stick it in a spreadsheet, that's a great start on complying with the uh, PCI requirement to maintain an inventory of applications and software. And the reason you want to do that is, let's, let's say, for example, that a vulnerability is announced in a particular piece of gear, whether it's in scope or not. You want to be able to quickly say, where is everywhere in my environment where that gear and that vulnerability exist to direct your uh, patching to where it will have the most effect and where you won't miss anything. So these two things can actually interact in a positive way. If you can, you know, click a button and download a spreadsheet of every device you have, its IP address, its security policy, its MAC address, it's fairly easy to extend that spreadsheet to meet the PCI requirement for an inventory of devices and versions that are in scope. And it's easy enough to where you should apply it to the devices that are out of scope as well. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Because, you know, that's there's so many facets of PCI. Like you said, there's 300 questions, right? <laughs> and and so um, one of them obviously is to is to track your your assets. So and and all the devices that especially have payment cards going through them. So um, one of the things that we're also seeing a lot these days is, especially in our industry, in the U.S. petroleum industry, is that I think folks are are starting to get their their heads wrapped around the fact that they need to in, to secure the payment card data, you know, and as we just talked about, don't forget about all the other Internet of Thing devices type type of devices that are connected to your to your network. Or as Mark said earlier, you know, some some are actually putting in a separate internet connection, so they're not even mixing the payments with that. But where I was headed with this is that we're starting to see people's like main offices get attacked, and they want they want um, they put in malware and ransomware and want Bitcoin in exchange to fund their to fund their payments. Are you starting to see some of that happen in in your segment as well? Yes, uh, yeah, we do see that. Um, basically, I think everything you've read about in the newspaper regarding a cyber attack or a threat vector, we have observed somewhere on networks that we manage for our customers. Um, there are a few cases that are discussed in study groups uh, that are like what you've said. We, I, I'm thinking of one case, I won't be specific about it, where uh, clicking a phishing email, it, it's actually a combination of the things that we cautioned against. Uh, a headquarters employee clicked on an email and got malware employed, uh, deployed onto their PC. That headquarters did not have lockdown rules so that particular employee's PC could access everything in the, all of the stores in this uh, uh, chain, all of the yeah. stores PCs then got the malware and the cleaning effort was, uh, well, it was horrific and it was a, a, a disturbed operation significantly. So here's a case where if you had those um, onion layers, if, if you had segmented the home office and the stores away, if you had uh, put a lot of segmentation inside the uh, each store to have the different categories of devices on different segments, that would have helped. This particular um, uh, victim um, had enough segmentation where we don't think there was any um, data loss, but it was a big headache and, you know, nobody um, ever gets up in the morning and says, oh boy, today I get to go to work and clean up behind a breach. Uh, that's a pretty uh, pretty unpleasant process to have to go through. One of the things, you know, when, when we were talking about uh, uh, this whole area of the different classes of users and geographical locations, one of the things I wanted to highlight is the increasing desire to offer the convenience of Wi-Fi connectivity to the general public at stores. And we 
think the best thing that we've seen in that area is the a handful of uh, operators have put in a completely separate broadband connection for only customer Wi-Fi. Uh, so there's no connection between customer Wi-Fi in the region of the store and the stuff that's in the store at all. I think that's wow, a little. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a little uncommon because often uh, handheld devices uh, made by uh, a number of people who are support using technology to support efficiency in store operations. Those handheld devices often need uh, in-store Wi-Fi um, uh, that is not available to the general public. So when you when you start talking about Wi-Fi, it gets harder to physically observe um, a, a network attachment. But if your vendor is able to uh, observe a wired network attachment, they should be able to observe a wireless one and then to implement all the controls that we have talked about. That's, again, more great information today. So um, we have uh, no further questions. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up today? Uh, we'd like to thank everybody for their time and attention. Well, we would like to thank you for all your expertise that you shared with us today and, and as well as your time. So thank you very much, and I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.